I am of the opinion that turkey vultures are the ugliest birds in the world. You can see through their beak, through their nostrils for crying out loud. They're the closest thing to the living dead in the animal kingdom. I'm sorry, but I get anxiety and a warm, queasy, shivering feeling inside when I see a funnel of circling turkey vultures. After moving in with my boyfriend, we've spent a lot more time outdoors in the wilderness. That's fine by me. I'm no princess when it comes to adventure, but I feel like I've seen those birds just a little too often. He started talking me into going camping with him a few times, and the more I agreed, the more often we camped. No, really. It was nice. It was a beautiful way to spend our time together. But it never lessened the effect of seeing turkey vultures when we did. And they just look like these floating shadows, never flapping their wings, like they're lost leaves from a tree of death, and they're looking for souls to devour. Their head is just a thin layer of skin away from being a bare bone skull, like that mummified turtle from Super Mario. One camping outing, it seemed like we never lost sight of those birds, and it drove me nuts. I started getting heart palpitations that made me tremble, and I could not stop sweating, no matter how cool the night got. It dragged on for several nights, and I quietly suspected that my boyfriend was trying to get me to overcome my fear of the birds, or he was trying to wait them out. But for whatever reason, they always stayed near. I began coming up with all kinds of paranoid explanations, that there was something dead nearby, and we had been camping close to some serial killer stash of bodies. That couldn't have been the case, because the funnel stayed on the move. One day, they were swirling over in the south. The next, they were over in the northwest. But they just would not go away. I woke up one morning to see the funnel of vultures so close by that I probably would have been standing under the vortex if I walked toward them for two minutes. I couldn't take it. I tried to wake my boyfriend and tell him that we desperately needed to relocate our camp but he was still knocked out. We drank the night before, so he was in a beer coma, and my fear of those birds was amplified by all the sensitivities that came with the hangovers. That's when I got a whiff of something really bad on the breeze. The wilderness is full of all kinds of aromas, but this one was a crime. It had to have been the smell of death, but I wondered what could have died nearby and progressed to such a state of stench in such a short amount of time. We surely would have noticed something that profoundly dead the day before. A wild thought entered my mind, and I had to brush it off. The idea that whatever had died was still moving around, and it came near to us since the day prior. I had to put my mind at ease that there were no human bodies left out to bloat in the heat and that there were certainly nothing dead walking around. That decision was the single worst thing I could have done that day, and I still don't think I've recovered from the aftermath. I followed the ghastly smell away from our camp to where the funnel of buzzards was centered, a plain filled with large rocks. It wouldn't be a stretch of the imagination to say that the rocks resembled monoliths that were eroded down to such simple forms that they looked like they were all but natural formations. The longer I looked at them, the longer I wondered if they had indeed been made by humans. These were places of Arizona that held history, spending decades and centuries that never made it into any kind of record. It was perfectly possible that I was approaching grounds that were once upon a time, sacred, and the stories of the land were written only in the pages of the hearts of the people that told those stories. I was enchanted just enough to forget about my fear and apprehension, but not for long. I saw movement 
that my brain wanted to interpret as the trembling of dried brush in the wind. I looked a few seconds too long to see that the movement belonged to a bony, withered hand. Or was it a paw? It was attached to something that had no business being human. It lay on its side, stretched out, perhaps sleeping. Every last bone was exposed, save for a few strips of cured, dried-out flesh that resembled autumn corn husks. Tendons stretched and contracted like morbid strings, allowing the monstrosity movement. It was moving in its sleep like a cat or a dog would. It raised its head toward me, as if awakening. It had to have been some sort of horse's skull, but it was crowned with two sets of antlers. Flies I could visibly see darting in and out of the eye sockets and ribs, sounding like a violin soundtrack to a horror movie. The thing stood up, and it towered over me by nearly three feet. Its movements sounds of skin crumpling like dried paper, hollow, light clattering of bones without any extra mass growing on them. I don't know why this was the most frightening part, but there were trinkets and charms in the antlers, suspended by short lengths of strips of leather. When it stood, fifty other dead things like it also stood up, all around me. They once were hidden, but now visible. The vultures overhead seemed to be hovering lower and lower, wanting to strike at the dead things, but too afraid since they were still moving. I knew how they felt. I ran back to the camp and wakened my boyfriend. I babbled breathlessly about what had just happened and what I saw. He poked his head outside the tent, squinted in the direction I indicated. To my relief, the funnel of buzzards had moved much further away. It meant that my boyfriend probably wasn't going to see evidence of my story, but that was fine with me that day. Hands down, that is the most terrifying experience of my entire life. I was out for a drive one evening, just to clear my head from a rough day in the office, when I saw something that was really weird, and I wished to God that I had taken a photo, as it doesn't even seem possible. The village that I live in is full of old myths and legend, but that isn't wholly unusual in my part of the UK. Stories passed down from generation to generation, usually involve some sort of witchcraft, and one of the most popular stories involves the smelling of fire in the woods on the anniversary of a witch being burnt there, centuries back. It hadn't even dawned on me at the time that it was the alleged date when I went out for a drive. Like a lot of people, COVID had hit my job hard, and a lot of people in the office were under tremendous stress. People had been laid off, which meant those of us who were left were lucky, but were carrying almost a double workload. It was close to midnight when I realized that I was driving past the famous woods in question, more on a whim than anything else. I wound down my window and sniffed. I was astonished to find that I actually could smell wood smoke. However, it was close to Halloween and bonfire night, so it could have been something to do with that. But I was miles away from any houses or gardens. And then I saw her. I only say her, because the only thing I could think of was that she was the witch. Otherwise, it would have been impossible to ascertain what sex she was. You see, standing at the side of the road, almost hidden by the trees, was what I can only describe as a skeleton being. Only it wasn't quite, as there were still bits of flesh and even some long hair on the skull. To start with, she could have been mistaken for a Halloween decoration, although I have no idea why somebody 
would put one all the way out here. But I was desperately trying to come up with any logical and plausible explanations for what I was seeing. But if this was a model, it would have been in a film like Shaun of the Dead, because it was far too realistic to be some sort of prop. And then she moved, raising her skeletal arms, which were little more than bone with some black and charred flesh, and screamed. That was it. I was gone. The smell of the burning wood, which is usually pleasant, and evoke thoughts of sitting with a beer in front of an open fire in the pub, was replaced by the carnal stench of barbecue and burning hair. I gagged and wound the window up, ramming my foot on the gas. I wish I had thought to take a photo, but my phone was just sat on the passenger seat next to me. In truth, I was too scared. Seems the myth of the burnt witch is true, and I did not want to hang about to see if she was interested in revenge, assuming that is what I saw. Maybe it's some horrible creature from the depths of hell, brought on by the rituals and black magic that takes place here to this day. I live on a ranch, and we've been having some problems with coyotes. So, I'd set some traps along the edge of the property line. One morning, I came down real early, and the horses had been kicking up a storm. I knew there must be something out in those traps. So I grabbed my gun and headed on down just to see what we had caught. As I got closer, I could see whatever it was didn't look right. It was more or less a bunch of skin and bones curled up on the floor, and there wasn't much skin. It also appeared to be moaning, not whining or even panting, but groaning. I didn't get any closer, and just stood wondering what in the damnation it was. When it uncurled itself, it looked up at me, and I did the only thing I could think of and unloaded my gun right into it. it. Didn't make a scrap of difference, though. The bullets either bounced off the bones or passed right through it. Once I was out, it looked up at me again, and what was left of its face... All I could see was two glowing white eyes. But there was something very ominous about the light emanating from this thing's skull. Like it was evil. It seemed to grow as it stood. And before I knew it, there was a full-sized person's skeleton with flaps of skin and hair covering small bits of it and its eyes. If this thing had once been human, it was now all deformed and despite being stood up, the spine was curved and one arm hung much lower than the other. It was like the hunchback of Notre Dame, but the only other thing I could. I stood up real tall and shouted as loud as I could, Get away from me. I don't think for one second that that thing was the least bit afraid of me, but it didn't seem to like the fact that I wasn't standing there shaking. It turned and walked back into the woods, and I couldn't quite believe how fast it moved. It disappeared, and so I examined the trap. It hadn't even been set off, which meant it was just lying there, waiting, as if on purpose. I don't know what that thing was, or what it wanted, but it didn't like me showing that I wasn't scared.